Okay, now, the third and final thing that we need to tackle today is the toughest one, okay? It's the schedule. And the reason I say that is because, once again, I find myself in a situation where I don't know what to play, I don't know when to play it, I don't know how to play it, and it seems like no matter what I choose or what I do, no matter who I listen to, I get told I made the wrong decision, I screwed up, this and that. All right. Man, who would have thought that even after RPG Overload was over, DSP was still incapable of making his own decisions and deciding what game that he was going to play for his own stream. Nobody could have seen that coming. Consider me absolutely godsmacked. But he's been doing this a lot more recently where he's constantly throwing himself a little pity party saying, oh, there's nothing that I do that's correct. Everybody tells me to do this, that, or the other. And every time I do something, I'm always wrong. And I really just don't have the patience for it. DSP, blow it out your ass. Nobody wants to hear you whine and cry about how you never do anything correct and you you're always wrong. Either listen to the feedback and play the games that the people want to see or play whatever you want. Pissing and moaning on stream really should not be an option as it doesn't actually provide any sort of entertainment to the audience that you want to entertain. Obviously it entertains the trolls, but you claim that you don't make content for them. So to give you some perspective here, all right, here's my perspective, all right? This year, we are now in April. So three months have passed in 2024, right? I do not feel at all that this year has had one highly in-demand blockbuster game at all. And that is very odd. I guess that would really depend on what your definition of a blockbuster is though, DSP. But given the definition that I'm looking at over here on Miriam Webster, there have already been plenty of games released this year that fit the definition of blockbuster. And I noticed that he added a little qualifier at the beginning of that, saying that it also had to be highly in demand, which is just kind of redundant given that that kind of just goes with the definition of being a blockbuster. Can't exactly have a hit if people don't want it, you know? But my point absolutely stands. Plenty of games have released this year that sold incredibly well and people absolutely door so i'm not quite sure what the hell you're talking about previous years around these times we've had games such as elden ring hogwarts legacy resident evil 4 remake just to name a few in the last couple of years and each time one of those games came out it felt like an event it felt like this is something everyone's excited for this is something everyone wants and then when i played them that's exactly what happened people got excited they came to the streams they watched they supported they loved the fact that i was playing the big game Okay. So just to clarify, he's trying to say that there hasn't been any blockbuster games released at the beginning of 2024 simply because he has the inability to drum up any sort of excitement or interest in his own streams. Because that's all this is really boiling down to. Because people absolutely love some of the games that have already come out this year. Games like Helldivers 2, Final Fantasy 7, Balatro, Balatro, I'm not quite sure how that one is pronounced. Danny loves it though. And that's just to name a few. So like I said, just because you can't make people interested in the content that you're making doesn't mean that the video games are to blame because there's plenty of other content creators who are doing entertaining content with the games that have come out and are having a blast doing it and this has been usually every year within the first quarter there's a game like that okay right this year what have actually been the biggest hypest games that everyone talks about Cal world hell divers 2 okay and what's the latest one there's another one out i think right now that everyone's talking about right now, do you see the difference between the last two to three years and this year? You'll notice the big pattern, correct? That's different here, right? I can't believe I forgot about Pal World, my bad. But you only listed two games released this year, DSP. Tism or not, I don't know if you can really identify a pattern if you've only given us five games total, two of which were from this year. So please, tell me what this pattern is. Tell me what I'm supposed to be seeing, because I'll tell you, I don't see it. The difference is, previously, these were giant games that were AAA releases that were readily available on every platform that everyone wanted to see me play. It was an easy slam bang decision. Let's get them, let's play them, let's do it. And even if they didn't last, for example, Hogwarts Legacy did not last that popularity the entirety of the playthrough. It was basically like the first couple of weeks and then it died out. But still, it was that event, big event feeling. So the pattern that I was supposed to be seeing was that you didn't have to make a decision and that people were interested in your content. How was I supposed to guess that from you just listing the titles of the games? I'm not quite sure how that was going to ever make sense. But I want to point out a couple of the things that he just kind of snuck in that little bit there. Because one of the first things that I heard him say was that they're big AAA releases. As if being a AAA release automatically makes everything quality and people are going to love the stream that you make. When the reality of the situation is that AAA titles at this point are constantly letting people down and missing the mark. And he also mentions 
happens that these games were on all of the platforms. Now, I appreciate just as much as the next guy when games are on every single platform. I hope that everybody can play all of the games that they want to play. But why is that something that he even has to take into consideration when deciding what games to play for his stream, when deciding what content that he's going to make? Because he owns all of the platforms. He owns an Xbox. He owns a PlayStation. He owns a Switch. And whether he likes it or not, he owns a mini PC and could be playing PC games if he really wanted to. He's not excluded from any of the would-be titles. So what was even the point of saying it? I'm confused. When I went into those playthroughs, correct? And that was good. And then what you do is when you have those big event feeling games, you fill in the blanks with other games and everything works fine, correct? You say that, and you ask me correct as if I'm just going to agree with you, but given your track record and your history on the platform of YouTube, I can tell you that that is apparently not how this works. You play these games that you're hyping up right now, these Elden Rings, these Hogwarts Legacies, and then you still get on stream every single day and say that support is low and you're not going to be able to pay your bills and you don't know how you're going to make ends meet and, you know, yada, 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 the thing that you do. So I guess my final answer is, uh, no, that's not how it works. And if there was ever proof in the pudding, it's your pudgy ass. This year... We haven't had that once. And I, I mean that. With Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, maybe for me and for the Yakuza audience, we felt that, but that did not feel that way across the board in gaming. It's a, it's a small niche audience that likes that Japanese-centric culture JRPG style game, right? Let's be honest here. That's absolutely true. I thought Final Fantasy VII Rebirth was going to do it. I thought that would be the big game. Absolutely not. When I started playing Rebirth, within a couple of streams, all the hype had died down. People were already talking about other RPGs that were already out or about to come out, or they were talking about Helldivers 2 or something else like that. Just because your audience wasn't interested in watching you play Final Fantasy VII doesn't mean that a bunch of people weren't really enjoying Final Fantasy VII when it came out. Because when the game came out, even though I'm not a Final Fantasy enjoyer, I heard about the game. People were telling me about the game and how much they were enjoying it. I had many people on my friends list that were playing the game. And he very dismissingly mentions that people were talking about Helldivers 2, which is really ironic, and I'm sure most of you are aware of why. And while that game technically isn't on all of the platforms or a AAA game, people were very excited for it, continue to play it, and it has a massive appeal. There's absolutely no reason that DSP couldn't have capitalized on Helldivers 2's success. Except, of course, for his own ego and ignorance. But if you're willing to accept that as sound reasoning, you could just fill that in for just about everything in DSP's life and it all makes sense. This year, there has not been a single game that has been so big or so momentous or so hyped or so in in line with what everyone wants that it becomes the talk of the town and the one major focus at all. It just hasn't happened. And you can say, well, what about Helldivers 2? Yes, but that's for a certain audience. That's for those who like the indie game, for those who like a co-op game online. It's not for everyone. You know, people playing Helldivers 2 are not necessarily the same people who are going to play an RPG, who are not necessarily the same people who are going to play a fighting game, right? But when everyone, everyone ran to play Elden Ring, everyone ran to play Resident Evil 4 Remake. You see the point I'm making? No, because that's just not true. There is not a single game that is for everybody. Quite literally, not a single game is ever going to be for everybody. I know tons of people who didn't play Elden Ring. I also know tons of people who didn't play the RE4 remake, and I'm one of those people. I couldn't justify spending the money to buy the remake when I just played the game a couple of years ago and had a good time then. So I'm sure that you think that all two of your examples are proving your point and helping your case, but it's the exact opposite, actually. I'm more convinced now than ever that you have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm just stuck wondering why these games have to be absolutely hyped and adored by everybody for them to be something that you're going to play. Why can't it be as simple as you enjoy the game and want to share it with your audience. I thought that was the whole point. There really hasn't been at all one game that has stood out and been the big game in the first three months of this year. Instead, like I, and I've explained this, what's happened, I feel like people have gone into their own pockets, their own little niche communities for each kind of game that they like. The RPG players are having a great time because there's a million RPGs out right now, but they're kind of clustered because there's so many out, they don't even know what to focus on, right? The people who like the online co-op stuff, they're all playing Helldivers. Fighting game players were playing Tekken 8. Then a DLC came out for Street Fighter 6. They moved on to that. So even there, there's like a discrepancy. Is it Tekken 8 or is it Street Fighter 6 right now? Right? Like the focus is just all over the place. And when that happens, it's very hard for me to do stuff that appeases my audience. Then that's a you problem and not a game problem, DSP. People have always had specific interests. Even though very often there was crossover and a lot of people play a lot of different titles, there's always going to be people who prefer one style of game over another. It sounds to me like maybe you don't know your audience or here's an idea, stay with me for a second. You're never going to be entertaining regardless of what game you're playing, so you can play every game under the sun and it will never matter. And as the DSP storyline continues day after day and year after year, that theory is only proven more true. Right? I was locked in this huge playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3 for months and months. Months. I wanted to keep playing Like a Dragon. I toughed through it despite the fact I knew that the majority of my audience wasn't paying attention. I got through both. 
And now I'm at the end of the tunnel. I'm, I'm doing new stuff. I'm enjoying myself, by the way. Like, Alone in the Dark is great. I'm going to keep playing that game. It's probably going to be about two more major streams. And uh, I'm very excited for to continue playing and finishing it. And people are showing up for it and engaging and supporting the streams, which is great. That's why I find it odd that here we are and it's saying like one of my videos of it has 100 views. How is one video of over 400 views and one has 100? It's the same playthrough. What would make someone watch one video three times more than the other when it's an ongoing narrative playthrough? It makes no sense. I think YouTube's fucked up. Okay, but anyway. <clears throat> I absolutely, in some capacity, am jealous of DSP's ability to just shove all of the blame onto everything else other than himself when things don't go his way. Because I very much don't understand that. One of his videos has 400 views and the next one has 100 views and he's thinking that YouTube is broken and my first thought is nobody wants to watch your goddamn video, you slob. I just can't imagine how much better you must feel knowing that you've done everything correct and nothing wrong all of the time. Because whether people like to address it or not, being the best you possibly can be and constantly trying to improve the things that you are doing can be very tiring. But DSP doesn't have that problem, because apparently to him, he's already the best. And that's why he did a 70-hour playthrough of a game that nobody in his audience actually wanted to see. Because he likes the game, and if they don't, that's a them problem. They need to figure that out for themselves. And after they do that, they need to reach for their Velcro wallets and go ahead and pop that puppy open. The point I'm making here is, I'm trying to make the right decisions, okay? And I've made some decisions based directly on your feedback, but now the result that's happening afterward isn't as expected. And I need to know what you guys want me to do because for the month of April, I mean, we're, we're going to know better when we hit up uh, Saturday and my, my marathon event for my birthday because on Saturday, we're going to be going through the game schedule. And when we do that, we're going to see exactly what games come out when and we'll be able to see, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll be able to see what happens with new releases versus time in between new releases and see if we want to fit in other games and things that's going to help for sure well if you're in this predicament now and it would really help you i don't understand why you don't just take a look at the schedule now why are you putting it off to your birthday marathon that doesn't make any sense every decision he makes is just so confusing i don't understand how you can have a problem and have a thing that would help you figure out what the solution is and you just decide to postpone it until later just because and that's before even addressing how absolutely regarded it is to do a schedule segment on your birthday marathon Marathon, as if that is some sort of event that people are going to want to show up for. You know, talking about the schedule. That thing that we do every single day, even though people constantly ask you to not do that every single day. But right now, for the month of April, I'm uncertain on what to focus on, except Elden Ring. Because I need to play Elden Ring, all right? I need to get back to the point where the DLC is, right? I have to. If I don't, I can't play the DLC. And I know everyone wants to see the DLC in uh, June, correct? I am praying to every deity, including Femviga, that the Elden Ring DLC streams absolutely tank and nobody shows up. He's been hyping them up too much. He's relying on them like a crutch. He's going back and playing Elden Ring even though nobody wants to see it. I hope they just absolutely flounder. It would really just be him getting what he deserves. Guys, I'm just going to say this right now. Shut up about Stellar Blade. We're not even talking about that. That's later in the month. I've already said I'm not interested in it. And if you spam the chat with it, no matter who you are, I'm going to time you out. So shut up about Stellar Blade. That's not the topic right now. You have to listen to what I'm saying and stop spamming chat with nonsense, okay? Shut up about it. It gets tiring, it does. When people say the same shit every day, and I've already tons of times explained rationale of why I'm interested in a game or why I'm not, you should respect my decision to want to play a game or not and not fucking spam chat like a child. So please stop. Okay. And in case you missed it in the chat, that was a direct call out to Eternal Napalm, long-term Denton mod, who simply said Stellar Blade and then asked who was hyped for Stellar Blade. Now, I was told the other day that saying Stellar Blade in the chat was an instant ban or timeout. Apparently that is not the case, but apparently what is true is that if you say Stellar Blade in the chat, you will get a pop off from DSP and it doesn't matter who you are, even if you're the longest term dent, because not looking at girls in video games is far more important than even your most loyal fans. Now, here's what's going on right now with my current playthroughs. Let me get you all caught up with this, okay? Right now, Alone in the Dark's doing good. Every time I play it, good attendance, good engagement, good support. Playthrough, playthrough was doing fine until this view issue, which I don't know was an issue or not, what the hell's going on with it, but it's go, it's doing well. Okay? Cool. Excellent. Um, We are about to jump back into Elden Ring. I don't know how this is going to do. I don't. But I feel like this is a necessary thing I have to do anyway. Right? Correct. I have to play Elden Ring. We have to get to the DLC portion. It's going to take a bit because I have to get back into the game. I, it's it's reacclimated. I have to add this word to my vocabulary because I keep saying other words that aren't correct. It's the word is reacclimated. It means you have to get adjusted back to a climate. Like let's say you were living in a hot, hot, warm climate, but now you're moving somewhere where it's cooler, right? 
So you have to get reacclimated. That's what it is. I've, I've been away from FromSoft for a year. Yes, I did play Lies of P, but that played a lot more like Bloodborne. I have to get reacclimated to the world of Elden Ring. I have to get up to the point where I can do the DLC. It's going to take a bit. There's a while to go, and there's content to do before we get there. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for pig explaining the word reacclimated to me, DSP, for everybody who didn't understand what the word meant. Now you know. But getting up to that point in Elden Ring is the kind of thing that I think a lot of streamers, a lot of content creators would do offline. They would understand that by now the magic build has lost its audience, and that if you're only going to play the game to get to the point for the DLC, then you should probably just get to that point by yourself and just have it ready to go when the DLC comes out so you can show that to your audience, because it's the new thing that people are going to be hyped for. But not DSP. He can't be bothered to play games offline by himself like a normal person would the only time we can play games is when we're actively making money if that's not the case then the system can't even be turned on dude so this is necessary regardless and again to reiterate why i need to play elden ring now i don't want to start elden ring in like may play for a month get to the point where the dlc is and then immediately start the dlc that's too much elden ring you know i want to play some now then be able to take a break from it and then go back to it feeling refreshed for when the dlc comes out and that's my po my point here is that's why this is the right time to start elden ring again okay so just to clarify, we're playing Elden Ring now so that later we can play Elden Ring again, which just means that we're going to have two separate occasions of where we're going to have to be reacclimatized to Elden Ring. We're going to have two separate sessions of gameplay where we have to figure out what we were doing, how our build works, and what is even going on. Instead of just playing the game right before the DLC comes out and going very smoothly into a transition of DLC. Hey, whatever works for your channel, man. You're the guy that's been doing this for 16 years or whatever at this point. You're the, you're the professional, not me. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. So, that's why Elden Ring is going to work, I feel. Okay? So, between Alone in the Dark and Elden Ring, that stuff is set, and I think we're good on that. All right? What's uncertain right now are the night streams. All right? First of all, tonight we're actually going to try the Star Wars Battlefront Classics Collection again. And I'm curious to see how it works and if it works. Because we played it on release day, and it didn't work <laughs> at all. It was just broken. Horribly laggy. Hit detection, not working. It was just a waste of time. Right? So... Tonight, they've patched it, and I want to see how much better it is. If it plays decently, then we can at least have it as a random stream every once in a while. I'm not saying it would be a regular thing, but maybe once a week, you know, toss it in there as a variety stream or something like that. I think that would work well, okay? <clears throat> I just find it so weird how adamant he is to work Battlefront into his schedule for some reason. There's just so many games that go by the wayside, including Final Fantasy VII at this point. But for some reason, Star Wars Battlefront, a game that we only paid $30 for and we don't even have a huge connection to in our legacy. And that's the game we're absolutely pushing for SummerSlam, or into the schedule, I mean. And for anybody who wanted to see some of that Battlefront gameplay, we watched it on stream. I'd recommend go watching that. It was very robust and meaningful to me. But it wasn't exactly any thing to write home about now exactly nick says i wonder if people already moved on yeah i don't even know if it works right i literally don't know if it works and if it does work how many people are playing it's a good question that's why we're going to experiment with that tonight okay <laughs> now i'm currently playing a game i'm nine and a half hours into it all right and i don't know what to do with it it's called dragon's dogma 2 okay i'm only playing dragon's dogma 2 because you guys and gals requested it Remember, originally a few weeks ago, I said I was set on playing Rise of the Ronin. Okay? I said I want to play Rise of the Ronin. And everyone was like, well, you can play Rise of the Ronin, but we feel that Dr Dragon's Dogma 2 is going to be a better choice. Dragon's Dogma 2 looks like it might be a Game of the Year contender. Dragon's Dogma 2 is just going to get better, you know, more people. It's going to get more viewership, and you should definitely play Dragon's Dogma 2. Okay. And in typical DSP fashion, this is just a massive retcon of what the reality is. Because he was outright saying that if he had his way, the game that he would be playing would be Dragon's Dogma 2. So obviously people were going to rush to his aid and be like, oh, DSP, then that's the game you should play. It's a game of the year contender and everybody's going to love it. It's going to be robust. But now that the game isn't doing well, he's saying that it's all their fault. They told him to play the game. He was going to play Rise of the Ronin and that was going to be robust and meaningful. Those were going to get the views, but everybody convinced him to play a game that wasn't going to do well. Just to Typical DSP behavior, blaming everybody but himself for all of the failings of his own channel. And I'm like, well, you know, oh, by the way, now I'm just going to start banning people because you now you're just doing it on purpose. So I'm just going to start banning people now. I mean, go ahead, keep bringing up Stellar Blade and see what happens. I've outright said no a million times. So every person who says it will just be banned and I'm going to laugh, actually. In fact, here's two. There you go, there's two. And let's continue. Just continue to say it and see what happens. <laughs> you want to test me? Go right ahead. I have a point to make on my stream. I have to concentrate and not be distracted by idiots. Okay. <clears throat>
So what I was saying earlier is true now. The mere mention of Stellar Blade is enough to get you banned in DSP's chat. Big ups. The person who lied to me before is no longer lying. Retroactively saved. Now, as I was saying, with Dragon's Dogma 2, all right, this is a game that basically combines the gameplay of a FromSoft game, say Dark Souls, with Monster Hunter. Like, I feel like that's exactly what they were going for with it, okay? Like, totally dead on, that's what they were going for. They didn't want it to feel <clears throat> like you were playing Dark Souls again. They wanted you to feel like you're in a team-based setting with others co-oping against these giant, you know, creatures that if you just soloed them, you wouldn't be able to beat them. Um, so essentially, it almost feels like a co-op Dark Souls, but it's not because you're using, it's AI, right? It's You're not teaming up with real people online or anything like that. That's really what the first game felt like. It's cryptic. It doesn't have a lot of explanation of what you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to go about stuff. <clears throat> And I just want to say, when he says that the game is cryptic, it doesn't tell you how to go about stuff. He's just simply saying that the game does not have waypoints. The game isn't actively guiding you at all times in the way that modern games typically do. There is still choices to be made. There are still missions to be done. But whether or not you do them in a manner that you're going to find satisfying is entirely up to you because there's quite a few options to do them in. But oh yeah, the game's super cryptic. Nobody's been able to figure it out. You gotta like uncover a cipher in order to actually understand what you're doing, obviously. So there you go. Um... A lot of people like that, a lot of people don't, right? Like, a lot of people feel like the game is too cryptic and has a lot of issues. And what I've always noticed is, is the moment I started playing it, people were like, wow, the game looks like shit. The game doesn't look like shit, it performs like shit. And what I mean by that is the graphics themselves are fine, but the game has a choppy frame rate because they did it in the RE engine, which isn't meant for an open world style of game, yet they did it anyway. And of course, at launch, they instituted motion blur and they instituted ray tracing. The game's frame rate is absolutely abysmal in some areas. That's 100% factual. But motion blur and ray tracing are just effects that most games implement at this point, And they usually give you the option to turn them off. But leave it to DSP to have the first thing that he mentions about a brand new game that people are playing be the graphics. The guy who only plays on console and refuses to play on PC. You know, the platform where he would have the most control over what the game actually looks like. That just never makes sense to me, dude. If you're gonna be that obsessed about an aspect of your game, you would think that you would go out of your way to have the best version of that. And in this case, the best version of that would have been the PC port. No matter how poorly it runs, you would have had the most options. So the whole first seven and a half hours of my playthrough do look bad, but as of last night, they patched the game and now you can disable that stuff. And now the game looks better. It does. It does look much better now. Um, so I think Capcom is addressing the issues. The problem is it took them a week and a half to get around to addressing any of them. And that could be an issue for a lot of people. You know, first impressions are everything right? And that's a problem. People look at first impressions. Wow, why is the game so choppy? They're going to say, well, I'm not going to pay attention to it anymore, right? <clears throat> I agree. First impressions are important, DSP, and that's why I think that you should go out of your way to make sure that every aspect of your stream, if it were a first impression, is a good impression. I can understand that that's a difficult thing to do, but you don't even seem to be trying anymore. I mean, just the other day, you were gone for 40 minutes while they tested the fire alarms, and you just left the stream up. There was nothing on screen to indicate that you were going to be back in an amount of time. There was no indication how long you were going to be, and there wasn't even music to keep people entertained while you were gone. You simply just left the stream up on a pause menu with no music. So I can agree, DSP, sometimes first impressions are everything. And you and the game have this in common in the fact that you don't leave the best first impression, and I can understand why a lot of people would not be interested in seeing this through. For me, I'm nine and a half hours in, and I'm on the fence about the game. Like, I don't love the game, but I also don't hate it. I feel like right now, I'm just kind of still feeling it out of what I think about it. There are times when I really like it, awesome moments when I'm smashing enemies and doing cool combos and taking out big bosses. I'm like, this is neat. And then there's other times, like last night, just listen to this. Last night, I freaking go for a mission, and the mission says, just go to a masquerade ball. Okay, so I dress in the clothing, I put on a mask, I walk into the ball. I get an achievement. It says, you attended the masquerade ball. And as I'm walking in, all the people walk out. And I'm like, where did everyone go? And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Is there a mission here or not? And I can't figure it out. So now I'm passing time, and the ball just won't restart. And everyone's like, yeah, so you're like the unluckiest dude on the planet. You literally walked into the masquerade ball as it ended which ended the quest. So now you have to cycle an entire day's time and come back at the beginning of the ball to have the NPCs start doing their dialogue triggers again so that you can actually have that mission advance. And any lifelong gamer at this point is going to understand that exact mechanic. Because when you have missions that are time-based, inevitably you are going to wander into a mission area to do the mission and the time is going to run out right when you get there. It is an inevitability, it will happen eventually. And it's not a completely ridiculous expectation that the player just know that they have to wait for the next day cycle to go through. It's not like the game is glitched forever. You didn't miss your one and only opportunity and the game is now softlocked. That's not 
what happened. All you had to do was go outside and sit on a bench where you could very easily access the time skip mechanic and then go directly into the mission again. But of course, this is DSP that we're talking about. This was a massive inconvenience for him. This is the type of mechanic that made DSP think that he had to have a guide in order to play this game because this is just, you know, one of those games you have to have a guide for in order to understand anything. It's like every game he plays, you could convince me he's never played a game before in his entire life, despite him playing games consistently for the past 15 years straight. And by the way, the cutscene that's supposed to play never played for me. There's supposed to be a cutscene showing someone walk behind the masquerade ball into a room and then you figure out, oh, there's a secret passage in that room. That's where you go. And it never happened for me. So it's like, I guess I'm just un Mr. Unlucky, right? So stuff like that frustrates me, you know? And the fact that the entire game, I know it's going to be a lot of walking going on foot and stuff. It's going to not be the most fun thing to watch at all moments. And he is just upset outright that the game doesn't have any sort of fast travel system that he can abuse. The game absolutely has fast travel in the form of ox carts, in the form of fairy stones. There are ways to get around the map quickly where you don't have to traverse the entire map. But if you're like DSP and don't want to utilize those systems for whatever reason, yes, you do have to walk across the map. And it is kind of generic sometimes walking the same paths over and over again. But if you ask me, that's the way that these systems are supposed to be done. You should be baking the fast travel of your game into the world and in turn making it so that it can't be used all of the time for every circumstance because then people just wind up not exploring your map. And I think that one of the best parts of Dragon's Dogma 2 is the fact that you can just explore the map. I get lost all of the time just uncovering new stuff and going places. But DSP hates that. He hates exploring the map. He hates getting lost. He hates not having a prime directive in where he's going because that's not how you make progress. And we have to be making progress at all times, dude. We have to beat these games on time. It's for the schedule. But uh, like I said, I don't think Dragon's Dogma 2 would ever work as a daytime stream. It's too lengthy. It's too dragging on. There's not a lot of story developments at all in it. Like there's almost no story in this game. Usually it's a few quick cutscenes, and you're right back to doing the kind of grindy style open world gameplay and combat, which is the majority of the game. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I don't think it's going to work in that regard as a day stream. You need something that's more narrative based or more action based for the day stream. You do. So, uh... That's why I made it the late night chill stream. People seem to agree. Yeah, it's going to work better there. So last night I played it. And now keep in mind, launch day, I played five and a half hours of it, but then I wasn't able to play it right again because I had to finish up Baldur's Gate 3 and Like a Dragon, which I have. No, 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 no. Let's tell the truth, Philip. You didn't have to finish those games out. You didn't have to move back into playing those games if you wanted to continue to play Dragon's Dogma 2 when it came out. The schedule is a beast entirely of your own making. Everything that has to do with the schedule is entirely your fault and nobody else's but your own. If there's any aspect of your content that can't actually be blamed on your viewers, it's the schedule that you make for yourself every single day. Because nobody is responsible for what games you play except for you on your very own stream. In the same way that I'm responsible for everything that I decide decide to watch on a Saturday morning stream. But of course we had to go back to these RPGs that nobody cared about and weren't making us any money. If you completely ignore the fact that Baldur's Gate 3 was making us a metric shit ton of money. Then I played it again on Saturday night and now I played it again on Monday night. Last night, people were, it was a decent attendance, let's put it that way. But what I found is half the people that were there were just there to troll. They were just a bunch of new accounts I'd never seen before. And they're saying stupid shit. And they're saying disgusting things. Their names are all messed up. And they're just sitting there trolling in the chat and like, ugh, you know. When I get a late night chill stream, I just want to relax with the audience and enjoy the game and, and interact a lot. We didn't get that last night, <clears throat> although there were a few people there that were very helpful with the game or whatever. Basically, it was very frustrating to have a lot of idiots in the chat. Like, oh my God, I got to deal with this shit, right? And how does that make the night stream any different from the day stream? He acts as though he just allows people to just troll him and be ignorant in the chat during the day stream, as opposed to the night stream where he just wants to chill. He always just wants to chill and have a good time. He never wants to deal with any sort of confrontation in his chat. He doesn't want anybody speaking the truth in there. So again, I don't know how this makes the night stream any different from the day stream, except of course, for the fact that we don't advertise the day stream as some sort of chill style event. But what that even means anymore, who knows? And to be very frank, all right? Engagement was low and support was very low. And, you know, the thing is, I can have like one, what's considered a late night chill stream game in the rotation where we don't get a lot of engagement or support. It's more about a smaller crowd, a niche audience that likes it, okay? And that's the game that, that's how it, how it happened. That's literally what Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth was. For end of January all the way until just this week, that was my late night chill stream game where for two months, I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of people. I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of support, but I liked the game and I wanted to continue on with it. And it went for 60 some hours, okay? 
But why is that a business practice that you employ? Why do you just accept that during the night streams, for some reason, you're going to play games that are not going to make you any money, that people are not going to be interested in, that's not going to hold your audience's attention, but you're going to play them anyway? Because that just doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't seem like a proper way to run your business. But you're the one that's constantly telling us all of the time that you have to do what's best for your business. And that's why you play the games that you play and why you don't play games that you don't play. It would only make sense to me that once you figure out that your audience isn't actually interested in these games, games like like a dragon that you would just put them on the back burner and never play them again or play them in your off time and give people periodic updates and maybe even highlight videos of your off time playthrough but of course that would actually uh, if in fact you did want to keep people updated in a playthrough that they weren't actively watching but of course that would require some form of editing and even worse actually watching a piece of dsp's own content so that's just off the table we have to make our entire audience suffer watching this game that they don't care about to the point where they wind up just not watching the streams again because that's that's what we call a solid business strategy here in the industry. It's okay to have one game like that in the rotation, but I can't have two, three games like that in the rotation. I've got to find games that people actually want to see, will come out to engage and support. That's how I maintain this business. That's how I'm able to do what I love for a living is that balance, all right? Again, if I just played all the games that I always wanted to play, it wouldn't work. I've got to find that happy medium between everything I love, what you guys love, and the things that we can do together that are going to work out, right? And that's why I love having these interactive conversations with all of you because I get your feedback right away and we get to, to judge what's going on. And honestly, that's why I'm upset about the comments. I was trying to get comments on the gameplay last night and my daily wrap last night to find out what to do today. And I couldn't get the comments approved. It really frustrated me. I'm like, dude, this is the time I really need feedback. And if YouTube didn't want to work, I'm like, oh my God, that's what that's really what drove me nuts this morning, okay? He acts as though the feedback that he's going to get changes every single day. And then the comments that he got approved yesterday and all of the feedback that he received yesterday on this stream are just not good enough and they're no longer applicable. And I can't even tell you with all certainty that this is a problem that YouTube was actually experiencing where people couldn't approve their comments because that's just not something that I have to do. And I honestly don't even think a thing that most people have to do. The comment section for most content creators on the platform, I imagine, would just be open. But of course, that's not the case for DSP. He's a special style individual who has to approve all of his comments manually because he just can't trust the common YouTuber to leave a comment that isn't going to be negative in some fashion when it comes to his content. So after last night's stream, it's like it, it, it performed so poorly. I mean, literally, I got like one super chat all night. I think it was two memberships and like two tips. So it was like maybe $10 raised. And again, it's not always about that. But is this going to be a pattern for this game? Is this going to be my late night chill stream game just like Like a Dragon where that's the case? If that's the case, okay. But then I got to be sure that everything else I'm doing is in line with what you want so that those streams do better. Okay? So that's the question I'm proposing to everyone. All right? Dragon's Dogma 2. What do you think about it? If you don't think the game's good, why? Is there something I can do about the playthrough to improve it so people will actually show up and engage and support with those streams? Or is it destined <clears throat> to be a game that people just aren't going to like? And if that's the case, why? Because I really want to know. Because remember, I was going to play Rise of the Ronin. I was dead set on playing Rise of the Ronin. And you guys convinced me otherwise and said, no. I remember the day I was sitting right here. And I said, what would you say? Everyone, DD2, 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 DD2. Everyone wanted Dragon's Dogma 2. But let me reiterate that he was absolutely not dead set on playing Rise of the Ronin. He was constantly leaving it up in the air. Every single time that he talked about the fact that he was going to be playing a new game on that Friday, he would let everybody know that he was undecided and that they needed to tell him what game they wanted to see. It was either Rise of the Ronin or Dragon's Dogma 2, and if he had his way that he would wind up playing Dragon's Dogma 2 because he was such a big fan of the first game, even though that anybody with eyes in their skull can see that that just wasn't the case. It's just outright disgusting to me that he would deny what the reality of the situation was simply so that he doesn't have to take any of the blame for his own decisions. Everyone asked for it. And I said, all right, I guess I'll change my mind. I'll listen to your opinions. I'll do what you want. And now here we are playing it. And now people are like, yeah. So what happened, right? What, where is that discrepancy? <laughs> is it a problem with the game? Is it a problem with my play style? Is it a problem with both? Is it, is it a problem with the time slot? I want to know. It's you, DSP. The game has a story. The game has interesting game mechanics, and it has an interesting world to explore and tons of things to do. The problem is that you made your audience hate the game by all of the things that you had to say about the game so far. And you simply don't have the personality required to make any sort of the traversal that's required during the game interesting. Because sadly, I hate to say it, this kind of game, um, I don't think would work as a day stream. As I said, the day streams usually have to be focused on games that have a lot of narrative or a lot of, say like different kinds of action and stuff like that. This game is just open world roaming, grinding a lot, a lot of repetitive combat, not a lot of big narrative or story elements at all. The game has almost none. It's very bare bones in that regard. It's more about exploring the world and smashing monsters constantly, right? 
Uh, he says that like it's a negative. The game isn't very story driven. It's about the gameplay, you guys. And you guys hate when I actually play the games. You guys insist that there's a long drawn out story that I can make fun of and imply doesn't make any sense simply because I have the inability to follow a simple story. Nobody cares about the gameplay around here. It's all about the story and the graphics, obviously. Modern gaming. Excuse me. So I need to know your opinions and I definitely want to hear. See, Zero says if you're not enjoying it, it won't work. Who says I'm not enjoying Dragon's Dogma 2? Is it too hard to, like, make a fun game these days? It's too difficult, right? Figure out what's fun in a game. You wanna know what's not fun? This right now. This is a complete waste of my fucking time. Where am I go- I don't know where I am or where I'm going. I can't tell where anything is at night. How is this the game's fault? Because the game is fucking stupid. It doesn't tell you how to do it. It just expects that you're gonna magically know when to go, how to go, how to do it. In order to get an entry, Dress in formal raiment. I have formal raiment. I have the mask. I walk to the waypoint and it lets me in and everyone leaves. That's the game's fault. So fuck you for saying dumb shit in the chat. Oh, that's your fault. It's the game's fucking fault, you fucking bozo. You complete mental midget. It's the game's fucking fault. I didn't make the game. I did what I was told and it doesn't work. You're an idiot. God, people are fucking stupid. Always blame the gamer. No, fuck you. The game is stupid right now. It's being dunce level fucking intellect. There's no way you to know when to do this. And I really don't even think that I have to say anything when it comes to those clips. There's no way that you're gonna convince me or probably anybody else that you were having fun playing Dragon's Dogma 2. And before any accusations of cherry picking get thrown around, that was out of a 40 minute clip that Hate Army did. Shout out for Hate, obviously. If you can compile 40 minutes of him being frustrated with the game just like that out of a two hour play session, yeah, I don't think that there's any convincing to be done. Like I said, I'm not in love with the game, but I feel like I'm just getting into a rhythm of playing it. I played it five and a half hours on launch day, two hours on Saturday night, two hours last night, and I just got a new build. I just got the warrior build and I'm trying to learn it. And are there some frustrating things about the game? There are, but I feel like just like with, my, with the first time that I played this game, it grew on me. Like originally when I played Dragon's Dogma 1 12 years ago, at first I was definitely kind of like, oh, I don't know about it. I don't know about it. But once I finally got into a rhythm, once I got a build that I really liked, I ended up enjoying it a lot more. I did treat it quite frankly, even though I wasn't a streamer, I treated it like my chill game. Of course, he's not going to take the time to acknowledge that the only reason that he began to have any sort of fun with the game and was able to treat it like a chill game despite not streaming was because his fans gifted him a bunch of items in game that made it way too easy and they gave him a bunch of overleveled puns that he used throughout the entire game. The guy very clearly didn't understand the fundamentals of the game and the way that the vocation skills work. He was just spamming light and heavy attack for the entire game, which is most definitely not how the game was meant to be played. But he was able to play it like that and never actually engage with the finer mechanics of the game because he was having his hand held. So I'm not surprised one bit that now that this new game, Dragon's Dogma 2, has come out and that's not the case, he's not being handheld like that, that he's not having any fun because he has to actually engage with the mechanics for once. Like, I would sit back and relax and I would play it and I would have a drink and I would grind and I would kill monsters and I would record that footage and upload it and honestly, it didn't do that well. Do you want to know the truth? Dragon's Dogma, the original playthrough, didn't do that well. I think it was like the first, you know, few days that I played it did okay, and then after that, once you got to the part where you realized, oh, the formula is just a bunch of open world grinding, it actually didn't do well at all, I remember, because I wanted to rush to finish it, because I was going on a trip, and then I beat it, but then everyone's like, there's a post-game dungeon, I was like, seriously? Well, let me just rush and finish the dungeon, and come to find out the dungeon is like six, seven hours long, I thought it was like an hour long, so I didn't, I was rushing to finish it, I didn't get it done, I just remembered that. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you remembered that DSP. It's nice to know that your brain is still functioning to some capacity up there, but I'm really not quite sure what that has to do with the game not performing well or even explaining why it wasn't performing well. But I'm not at all shocked at the idea of you trying to rush through a game and get done with the content as fast as possible so you could move on to something else. That's pretty standard over here on DSP Space Gaming. But speaking of things that are pretty common on our respective channels, this is gonna be a two-parter because this clip was 40 minutes total and there's no way I'm gonna do an hour long video plus. That's not gonna happen. But before before we go, I want to take a look at some of the comments from the last video because I absolutely adore all of your guys' comments. Shout out the 60 Skulls. Penitent Sin says he is getting increasingly unhinged and I'm here for it. And I'm absolutely here with you, buddy, because he is getting more unhinged. He's getting more desperate as the days continue. The only real question is how long can he keep this up? And that's the question that we're all dying to know the answer to. Tech 84 says he reminds me of a shady used car salesman with his here's the deal all the time. I'd tell you, if this guy tried to sell me freedom after a $25 life sentence, I'd still run as far as I could. And that really is a talent that DSP has. He has negative charisma. He couldn't sell you a bottle of 
enough water if you were dying from dehydration in a desert. There's just something about him. Or rather, there's a lot of things about him, but we're not going to sit here and list all of them. We'd be here all day. And Razor Sharp 5643 says, he is 100% lying about 60 to 70 hour work weeks. He works barely 30 hours. He counts stuff like sitting in the room when the stream is off, uploading videos to YouTube, music, breaks, even when he's browsing Twitter for news, all is work. It's all him being in his own reality. Absolutely right, sir. You'd have to be delusional yourself to actually think that DSP is working 60 to 70 hours a week. Not a chance in hell. If he legitimately had to work that many hours in a given week, he would have exploded, just spontaneously combust from exhaustion. The guy can't even walk up the stairs without taking a brief respite at the top at the ottoman that he installed. Speaking of people who need a brief respite, shout out to everybody who watched this video, especially if you made it this far. Hopefully I'll catch all of you guys in the next video, but until then, make sure that you check out other detractor channels and dive deeper into that. Snore tags. Ah!